Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second day of the 2022 Northern Ontario Ag Conference. My name is Cameron Ford, and I am the Project Development Advisor for the Northern Ontario Farm Innovation Alliance. Uh, and I just have a couple of housekeeping items before we get started with this morning's session. First, I would like to take <clears throat> first, I would like us to take a moment for reflection. We would like to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands which we each call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improve our own understanding of local Indigenous groups and their cultures. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territories of all Inuit, Métis, and First Nations peoples that call this land home. Please join me in a moment of reflection to acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and to consider how we are and can, each in our own way, try to move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Thank you. I'd like to remind everyone that we are recording all of the events for this webinar and we'll be putting them up online on the Northern Ontario Farm Innovation Alliance YouTube page for anyone who missed them or anyone who would like to see them again. Uh, keep an eye on Nofia's social media and we'll let you know when those are available. Uh, everyone is welcome to use the chat feature, but we ask that you please keep comments respectful and on today's topics. We also invite everyone to ask a lot of questions but we ask that questions please be put through the Q&A feature as it's easier on our end to keep track of questions that way rather than just sifting through the chat and finding them. At the end of each presentation, we will put the questions to the presenter. Today, we have this morning session, which will run to about 11 a.m. and then we'll take a break and we will return for a session from 1 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. and then we'll wrap up the conference with a final session in the afternoon from 3 p.m. to about 4.30 p.m. I would like to thank the Chicken Farmers of Ontario, Bioenterprise Canada Corporation, the Cooperation Council of Ontario, and FedNor and the Government of Canada for sponsoring this conference. This conference is presented in partnership with the Rural Agri Innovation Network, who will be moderating this morning's session. And with that, I will turn it over to David Thompson, the manager of RAIN. Good morning, everyone. In uh, this morning's sessions, we're exploring um, how, um, how we interact with roots and fungi for profitable and sustainable farms. Uh, there's a growing number of biological stimulants with arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, uh, which aim to restore soil health and enhance crop yield after resource intensive crops or soil disturbance. Uh, while there's a growing number of these commercial um, inoculants on the market, there's still uh, natural sources of inoculum already present in agricultural systems. And in this session, we're going to hear from a producer and a researcher who are focused in on the benefits and challenges of commercial inoculants. Uh, Rachel Boucher will be our first speaker. Uh, Rachel completed her Bachelor of Science in Biology at the University of Waterloo in 2021. Uh, she's interested in sustainable agriculture, plant microbe interactions, and improving crops. And her research focuses on the effect of native arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi on soybeans. She began her master's grad program at the University of Waterloo in association with Algoma University and the University of Guelph uh, last September, and with uh, some plans to, to come up to Algoma this year. Uh, so, Rachel, I'll welcome you to, uh, to give your presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'll just share my screen. Um, I, I think that. Um, I think that worked. So, um, good morning. Uh, as David said, my name is Rachel. Um, I am pursuing my master's degree. Uh, the project I am working on aims to 
augment the AM uh, fungal community in the soil and so as to increase the benefits that they can provide to the agro ecosystem. So yeah, again, this project is jointly supervised by Pedro Antunes at the um, Algoma University, Joshua Nokelski at the University of Guelph, and Marin Oberon at the University of Waterloo, which is where I'm based out of. Um, so today I'm gonna to be talking about the focus of my research are by vascular mycorrhizal fungi, also known as AM fungi, and their applications to agriculture as a bioinoculant. Um, so the word arbuscular comes from the Latin word arbor, which means tree. This is due to the highly branched structures within the plant root cells that resemble little trees, as can be seen in these images. And myco means fungus and rhizal means root. So these are fungus of the root. The image on the left is of a stained root. The green fluorescence is the fungal hyphae within the plant root cells. And these dense groups of hyphae are the arbuscules. These structures can be seen more clearly in the illustration on the right, with the hyphae going between the root cells and then into the cells to form these arbuscules. And these arbuscule structures are the site of nutrient exchange between the plant and the fungi. Um, so AM fungi are ubiquitous in soils. However, you're not likely to see them with your naked eye. They can be seen under a microscope, as in the picture on the left. You can see the very uh, thin hyphae and the larger circles are the spores. Um, so the figure on the right illustrates that mycorrhizal fungi are present in soils all over the world. The darker green color in the pie charts represents plants that associate with AM fungi, and it is clear that these associations make up a large portion of the plants around the world. Um, so AM fungi form associations with almost all plants, including important crops, such as corn, soybeans, chickpeas, barley, wheat, and many more. However, they do not uh, form associations with a minority of plants, for example, canola, mustard, spinach, beets, and buckwheat. Um, so this figure here shows uh, the evolutionary relationship between around 3,000 species of seed plants. Um, the lines colored in blue are those that associate with AM fungi. Again, as you can see, the majority of these plants form associations with the AM fungi. The purple lines are the plants that weakly associate with AM fungi, and there's not a lot of those. Um, the red lines represents non-mycorrhizal plants, that is plants that do not uh, associate with any mycorrhizal fungi. And the green lines are ectomycorrhizal plants. These uh, fungi mostly associate with trees, um, like truffles fall into this category, uh, as well as most of the mushrooms that you'll see, like if you walk in the forest. Um, you can see that the most basal node is blue, which indicates that this association between AM fungi and plants occurred very early on in the evolution of plants. And since then, only some groups have lost the ability to associate with AM fungi. But again, the majority of plants do form uh, these associations. Um, so as I was mentioning, plants and AM fungi have co-evolved together for over 400 million years. The relationship between the plants and the AM fungi is a mutually beneficial symbiosis. The fungi are obligate symbiotes, meaning that they rely on the plants in order to grow. The plants gain um, enhanced access to the nutrients, such as phosphorus, as can be seen in the illustration on the right, um, while the fungi are provided with carbon from the plant. This exchange of resources allows for the plants to have more efficient access to these nutrients. AM fungi also have been shown to in, uh, contribute to the plant's increased stress tolerance. The picture on the left shows a root. The dark lines coming out of the top of the root are the hyphae, and the arbuscules can be seen as the dark circles within the root. Again, these are the sites of nutrient exchange uh, between the plant and the fungi. Um, <clears throat> so the relationship between the AM fungi and the plant can provide uh, benefits that uh, definitely have applications within agriculture. Um, a field study was performed with different sources of AM fungal inoculum on chickpeas in Italy in order to see what benefits the AM fungi can provide. The study also looked at the effects of sowing in the fall versus in the spring. Um, this can be seen on the graphs with um, the black rectangles representing the fall and the white rectangles representing the spring sowing. Um, so they found that the chickpea sown in the spring had increased biomass due to associations with the AM inoculum. Um, and the graph on the left is looking at the AM fungal root colonization and comparing it to a control 
a foreign mixture of AM fungal inoculants, a local mixture of AM fungi, and as well as two different individual strains. So there was found to be around a three-fold increase in the AM fungal root colonization, uh, colonization in the inoculated plots. This shows that uh, the colonization, well, or, sorry, this increase in the colonization um, helps show that before the AM fungal community in the soil was suboptimal. And there have been many studies documenting this fact that uh, of suboptimal AM fungal communities in agricultural soils. Um, so the graph on the right is looking at grain yield for each of the different types of inoculum. And it shows that AM fungi can improve crop yield. 75% uh, increase in chick yield was noted. They found that the local fungi had a better yield than the non-indigenous um, AM fungi. This may have been uh, due to the higher colonization rate observed with the local fungi, which could be a result of that uh, fungi being better adapted to the soil. They do note that there might be some variation with the increase in yield uh, between different studies due to different soil contexts and differing genotypes between the plant and fungi that may affect the compatibility and the uh, symbiotic relationship. Um, so this was a meta-analysis. It was carried out to see if AM fungi are specifically adapted to their own local environment. This study examined, compiled, and compared the results of many other studies. Um, you can see in the Venn diagram that over a thousand studies were analyzed. However, none of them looked at the allopatric and sympatric pairings of the fungi, soil and plants in the same paper. Uh, that would be the number displayed in bold on that diagram. This demonstrates that more research should be done um, in these areas. So allopatry is when two populations or species are isolated uh, geographically from one another, while sympatry is when populations or species occur in the same geographic reason, region. So this study found that there were larger increases in plant biomass um, when the plant, soil, and fungi were sympatric compared to the allopatric combinations, as seen in the figure on the left. So the plants, fungi, and soil have improved performance when they are all like local species. This suggests that local fungi inoculants will be uh, more effective than the exotic strains. And it is an important um, thing to think about when considering uh, different in inoculants for um, your fungi. Um, so AM fungi not only have impacts on the plants, but also contribute to the overall soil health. Studies have shown that AM fungi can improve the soil structure. This is due to the hyphae of the AM fungi within the soil acting as a structure to stabilize it. This can be seen in the picture on the slide with the plant on the right um, with the extensive red uh, hyphae network, which allows for more soil aggregate, aggregates, more carbon and more water within the soil. The AM fungi pro, uh, produce a protein that also helps um, improve soil quality. This protein called glomalin contributes to the soil organic matter and aids in storing carbon and nitrogen in the soils, as well as improving the soil aggregate stability. And this allows for enhanced access, um, or sorry, enhanced water retention to this of the soil and decreases the amount of erosion. So I mentioned earlier that there's a, often a lower abundance of AM fungi in agricultural soils. Um, this can be due to many factors. One study demonstrated that reduced tillage, both in intensity and depth, had a much higher AM fungal spore density than conventional tilling methods. Um, this would be likely due to tillage disrupting the hyphae and uh, reducing the concentration of AM fungal propagules in the soil. Um, organic farming methods also have um, tend to have a higher AM fungal communities. Um, this has been attributed to the lack of fungicides and uh, herbicides with these methods. Um, one study found that with organic farming, there was greater AM fungal diversity, which led to increased phosphorus uptake by the plants and an increase in grain biomass. Um, so after non-mycorrhizal crops are planted, there's a decrease in the abundance of AM fungi in the soil, as there is no host plant for the fungi to grow. Uh, therefore, they cannot pro propagate, and this reduces the potential of colonization for future crops. If non-mycorrhizal crops are repeatedly grown, this can greatly reduce the AM fungal community in the soil. So even low amounts of nitrogen fertilizer can alter the AM fungal community composition. 
Nitrogen fertilization also uh, affects the exchange of nutrients between the plant and the fungi, with the plant having to provide the fungi with more carbon in exchange for relatively less phosphorus from the fungi. Uh, phosphorus fertilization reduces the hyphae biomass, which uh, then may reduce some of the previously mentioned benefits on soil health. Um, so AM fungi are used as inoculants in agriculture. Commercial inoculants typically only contain one strain, as opposed to the multitude of AM species that are typically found in soils. Studies have shown that uh, the more species present in the soil leads to improved plant productivity. Commercial inoculants can um, also be exotic to the region, which might not be as effective as the indigenous fungi. Meanwhile, indigenous fungi have the advantage of being diverse and more efficient. So this figure uh, represents a way to decide if you should use the AM fungal inoculants. First, you have to try to figure out the status of the current AM fungal uh, community in your soils. And this can be done by either assessing the abundance and diversity through scientific methods, or inferring from the history of the soil. You have to look at um, whether the AM fungi can be reestablished in the soil without inoculation. Um, and this could be done by reducing the tillage and sowing plants with strong AM uh, fungal associations. If things like that are not possible and you think that AM fungi will be beneficial in your agro ecosystem, then you should uh, find a local AM fungal inoculum to use in your soils. Although there are many benefits of using these um, AM fungi, there should be caution taken when using them, as there are many unknowns about these inoculums and how they um, affect the agro ecosystem. Um, so some of these uncertainties include how long the strains persist in the soil or if they establish in the first place. The establishment and persistence of the inoculum seems to be very context dependent. Um, with some studies finding that the inoculated AM fungi was still present after three years, but others found that the inoculum only persisted in the soil for three months. Um, so this appears very dependent on the local soil ecosystem. Um, there's also questions to the effect of the AM fungi on other microbes in the soil. Um, so there needs to be more studies performed on this to see if the microbial community is altered by these additions of inoculum, and then if there are any subsequent effects on the plants. Um, additionally, there needs to be more research on the invasibility of these inoculums to examine if they spread to other ecosystems so as to ensure that they don't cause any harm there. Um, so the purpose of this current project is to determine the effectiveness of using commercial AM fungal inoculants in contrast to using the indigenous AM fungal inoculants when growing soybeans in northern Ontario. Uh, and the end goal is to increase the on-farm indigenous AM fungi. Um, so in year one of the project, sorghum uh, sudan grass was planted as a trap crop in a small plot on the farm. The sorghum promotes uh, the growth and increases the abundance of the AM fungi since uh, sorghum forms such a strong association with the fungi. Um, in that same season, the canola was planted in the main field, canola being a non-mycorrhizal plant. It does not form associations with AM fungi and actually causes the AM fungal community to decrease. Um, so as the sorghum senesces in the fall, the fungi will sporulate, which increases the abundance of the AM fungi for the following year. This is the stage that we are in now. Um, so in year two, uh, this spring, the sorghum roots and rhizophyll uh, soil will be spread over the main field, which is when, uh, where the soybeans will be planted. Um, so within the experimental plots, the fertilizer will be varied at the the recommended dose and then half the recommended dose and the sorts of inoculum will either be the commercial inoculum or the cultivated indigenous inoculum from the sorghum plot. Um, so this summer, the majority of the data will be collected. Um, the weather, uh, weather will be measured daily. The weed emergence will be recorded once during the trial. Uh, we'll also be monitoring pl uh, plant growth. Um, using crop health, canopy light, biomass, final grain yield, and quality. Um, the fungal uh, growth will be examined by taking root samples, and soil samples will be analyzed for uh, nutrients, pH, organic matter, and microbial biomass. Um, these measurements will allow us to determine the effects of the different inoculum and fertilizer quantities on the soybeans so that we can determine if increasing the on-farm indigenous AM fungi is a viable method that can improve the production of soybeans after canola in Northern Ontario. So 
If our uh, hypothesis is supported, this method could reestablish the um, AM fungal communities after non-mycorrhizal crops deplete the soil of AM fungi. In this way, the subsequent crops could still have healthy AM fungal communities in the soil and uh, therefore gain the benefits that the fungi provide. Uh, this method may be more cost effective as you no longer need to purchase commercial inoculum. However, there does need to be land set aside to cultivate uh, the AM fungi um, with the sorghum. This method has the potential to be more sustainable since the AM fungi provide the crops with additional nutrients. This might allow for a decrease in fertilizer use, which would then decrease the chance of eutrophication of nearby water. So I, I want to thank all those that are contributing to this project, especially Pedro, Marin, Josh, Michaela, Melinda, David, and Nathan. Um, I also want to thank Amafra and Rain for their support with this project. And thank you for listening to my presentation and having me here today. Um, so we can open it up to any questions if there's any. Okay, uh, Rachel, I don't see uh, questions coming in now, but I had a, uh, I had a few. Um, is there, um, I guess, any research going on in uh, with plant genetics uh, to have improved relationships between fungi and plant response? Um, could that be a future part of of this this research? Uh, yeah, definitely. Like, I mean, um, like producers are constantly breeding for like better lines and better lines um, to adapt to different um, conditions. So, if like like more research needs to be done, and obviously, but like. It's definitely a way to go for the future, yeah. One question come in here is uh, where are you getting uh, the AM fungi? Maybe that's... Um... Am I allowed to say that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that we were going with... Um, it could the... just be more, more general if, yeah. if it's a single strain or is it... Yeah, yeah it was a single, uh, single strain. Um, and a granular form of it, uh, specifically for, I think, cereal crops. Okay. Um, where are the field trials being conducted? All right, so the field trials are being conducted in um, New Liskard um, and Algoma. And I believe there's two fields in uh, New Liskard, or is it there's two fields in Algoma? There's one of those things. Two in Algoma, one in New Liskard, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, would it be of interest to look at herbicide use uh, in in a trial in the future, uh, depending on you know on the success of this project? And what yeah, it uh, it definitely would be um, because like yeah, I could definitely see that as being something that would affect the fungi, um, and like even like the different variety of plants that um, come up within the soil, like the more diverse plants you have, like the better your community is. So reducing that with herbicides because like you only want the one crop in your field um like it would definitely have an effect on the, the mm -hmm. stuff okay great well uh, stick around rachel we might uh have more questions uh from you after dustin uh presents uh thank you very much uh rachel it's very interesting uh research you're involved with and we're uh we're happy to have you uh part of the team yeah, um, so, so uh next up is uh is dustin malak uh, Dustin is a University of Guelph graduate with a, a Bachelor of Commerce, and he's a, a Lindsay area no-till corn cereal and bean producer who uses regenerative production principles uh, like complex uh, crop rotations, companion cropping, uh, multi-species cover crops, and native biological amendments on his farm. Uh, he's the owner of Kawartha Cover Crops, a company uh, designed to inspire farmers to adopt cover crop use. Uh, thanks for joining us today, Dustin. Um, uh, you can uh, hopefully share your screen there. No problem. Thank you very much for having me. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Excellent. Share the screen here. That coming up all right? Yeah, I can see it okay. Okay, there we go. Well, thank you very much, folks, for having me today. I appreciate it. Uh, I will do my best to follow that presentation. However, I am a farmer and I am not going to be that fluid. <laughs> but thank you very much for the opportunity, though. We love sharing what we're doing here. I love pictures, so I'm going to have lots of pictures in my presentation here. Uh, 
but uh, let's get started. We are a no to 34 year no till farm here in near Lindsay, Ontario. We top out around the 2,700 heat units and we're farming on sandy loam soils. That is what has driven a lot of what we are doing here. We do not have a water um, rich area. We tend to miss a lot of rain, so we have to preserve what we have. In a picture of where we stand on our farm, this is a Ward Laboratories uh, PLFA test. Uh, as you can see, the, our, our total fungi there are our muscular, our muscular uh, micro For some reason, Dustin, uh, I'm not getting um, uh, your other um, your your other screen. It looks like it's just the preview view. You um, okay. might have to reshare your screen there. That coming in now or um yeah it's not full screen but uh maybe you could try that yeah there we go thanks that, that, does that change does that move yeah we're good uh, okay start that one again then don't be afraid to interrupt me if there's a problem um again our mycorrhizal fungi is averaging around the 4.74 percent of our total biomass in our soil that is considered a relatively good number um considering the no-till practices for for the that length of time our fungal to bacteria ratio is sitting somewhere around the 0 0.30, which according to Ward, Ward is in a very good situation there. So we're very, very happy with that. Uh, eliminating disturbance <clears throat> has, has led to that. Since then, we have begun to pull in our cover crops or multiple species and begin to use those. So we're hoping to improve it as time goes on. I'm going to repeat maybe some information that was shared already by Rachel, but we'll go anyway. So fungals, there are fungal, uh, fungus that colonize the roots of the host plants and they share symbiotically with the plant. An example of that would be corn. Corn can trade your phosphorus for nitrogen from a legume. At the same time, the mycorrhizal fungi works symbiotically and it's using that phosphorus to produce formula, which is going to end up being um, organic matter in our soil. It's something we want desperately. Um, it's a tree shaped branching, it's about a tenth the size of a root hair and increases the depletion zone around the root tremendously. We can use so much more water and lower the uh, um, the field uh, capacity of our of our soil. We can use more water in the darkest, uh, worst times in, in July and August. Uh, just a quick representation on the left, we have a regular root system, which is relying on its mass diffusion or uh, encounter nutrients in the soil with some bacteria and, and microbes living around the roots. But on the right, we have the extension of the mycorrhizal fungi that can pull from the soil and, and harvest so much more for us, water, nutrients, carbon. Unfortunately, they can be easily destroyed with, with tillage. Uh, <clears throat> this forces the mycorrhizal fungi to use carbon to rebuild the structure. This, for me, becomes a very large problem because once we start destroying the natural systems in the soil, our plants that we're growing as a cash crop no longer have availability to that. They're being used by another source. So we're, we're becoming depleted, and that's what, not what we want. <clears throat> this can reduce up to 90% of the carbon that's available to our plant in the top three inches. <clears throat> that's the microbes home. The most interesting part, <clears throat> excuse me, about the mycorrhizal fungi for me is the fact that they are the internet of the soil. There's research showing that there's the largest mycorrhizal um, organism in the world is the size of a football field. And when you, when a person walks on the uh, micro or on the, the field on one corner, the far corner knows that you are there. This is a living, functioning being. Now, one of the main issues that we're seeing is the microbial bridge is broken when the mycorrhizal fungi is not in place, when it's not there. That is, the plant is not able to uh, efficiently share uh, nutrients or, or carbons with the microbes and encourage their, their uh, populations to grow and bring nutrients back to the plant. Uh, there's, a, there's the internet or the transfer system is lost. And of course, they die because the presence of a living root. So that becomes a problem with our, our, our culture and farming currently. Here's an uh, electron microscope picture of an inno of a inoculated uh, root. You can see the huge tree structure that is sharing all across that, uh, that soil surface, pulling in a lot more nutrients. This is where the rubber hits the road for us. We've done some all metal tests <clears throat> with AL Labs and uh, uh, Biologics Company where we took our typical soil sample when we had a regular soil sample done with it. So you, see, you can see the standard test results at the top phosphorus 65 parts per million. Potash at 80, magnesium at 42. That's not good reading. We are not rich in a lot here. But when you do the all metal test, which is burning down the entire soil 
uh, fragmentation, burning it down to its, its complete composite, finding what is there, we end up with our uh, phosphorus ends up being 964 parts per million, potash 649, and magnesium 1728 parts per million. So we have lots in our soil. The problem is with the uh, with the extracts that we're using in the soil test and the power of our plants extract uh, sugars, we don't have the ability to pull it in. So we need these other organisms that are much more capable of harvesting our soil matrix and bringing it back to us. So it was quickly touched on the different type of uh, products that are on the market. There are single species uh, products that you can buy, uh, either in a liquid form or in a dry granular, but they contain only one species or one strain. And then there's multi-species uh, products which contain up to five different species in one product. Also, tectoderma are involved in some of those as well. Both of these are most likely not indigenous for your soil. So the problem there is, is making sure that we have survival. A major difference here is, um, another major difference is there's two types of sub products. Uh, there is cut hyphae. So they actually take the hyphae itself and cut it into small pieces, turn it into a powder. The issue there is when we cut a living hyphae, it only has about six months shelf life before it will not activate your soil. We don't know how long these products have been created and how long they've sat in transit, et cetera. So that becomes an issue. One of my favorites is the washed spores version. It is where they grow the plants, grow the hyphae out until maturity, and then it forms a spore or a hyphae uh, up on the seed. And then it's washed off their, off their, their meshes and we buy that actual product. We get the actual spore. I feel a lot more comfortable with those products because I know they're going to still survive when I use them. There's a quick demonstration of what a mono species will look like in your field. We have a lot of the same things. The danger here is that we have one chemical or one predator can simply take those, those guys out, right? They've got their number, they can take them down very, very quickly. A multi-species, fungi can look more like this. We've got all kinds of different diversity going on, different plants, different uh, microbes interacting, different nutrients interacting. If we see a predator or a chemical attack, we're not gonna lose them all. This is above ground. This is my, my favorite above ground diversity, which of course will lead to below, below ground diversity here. But this is a, uh, a 25 way uh, cover crop planted on our summer farms here lo local to us. Um, these plants are, every last one of them associates with a different micro and associates in a different way with microbes fungi. So if we can have these plants out there supporting these guys when our crop is not in the field, we're guaranteed, not guaranteed, we have a better success of maintaining them in our soil year round. This is that very same field as a soil sample that we drew out of it in the fall. We raised the cattle, so we had lots of um, animal, uh, ammonium nitrate <clears throat> being left by the animals behind with their urine and their, and their waste, et cetera. We left the sample in the shop for about three weeks, came back to send it away, and the hyphae had already begun to grow in the bag. Um, these structures can grow very quickly. Not saying this is mycorrhizal fungi, but this is one of the most like a sephora. But this is a fungus that's not growing in our sample bag. Some of the other factors that we are taking into account here on our farm is herbicide injury. Uh, with personal experience and some of the scientific research that we're looking at, we are getting into destruction of some fungal structures in the upper six inches. The problem with this is, is we see a very slow repair of fungus. Bacteria can double the population in 20 minutes. Fungus take a lot longer. We have fungicidal injury happening. We have stopped using seed treatments on our farm. Um, the reason is, is that seed treatment will have a halo around it, inhibiting any form of uh, association. The plant is unable to associate with a mycorrhizal fungi while that fungicide is there. Unfortunately, during that time, the plant is making its most um, uh, important decision of whether it's going to make that association with the mycorrhizal fungi and allow the colonization. If it cannot, it's just going to rely on mass diffusion. And again, in my situation here on my farm, we run out of water too quickly in July and August, and, and mass diffusion just is, does not uh, uh, work very well. Tillage, in, tillage injury is another big one. Because they exist in the top six, three to six inches, that's a lot of where the stress disruption happens. Um, ourselves, we've uh, used a reduced tillage, such as scripta, um, to, which only serves about 30 to 40% of the soil, which allows that, that existing hyphae to grow back. Now, I'm going to explain the, the scripto situation a little bit here. I know I said I'm, I'm no till, but I'm going to explain to you how, how we're doing that. Um, and then again, application time needs to be taken into account. My favorite, of course, is on the seed, either with a liquid drip or actually powder on the seed. 
but we have to make sure we're not in the high pre in the presence of high phosphorus, so dry, uh, high, uh, dry phosphorus or a very strong liquid starter. Um, or the better one that I prefer the most is applying it with my multi-species cover crops. We do not use fertility in order to go, not to break that soil uh, to uh, microbe link. And uh, we also has a very, very diversified amount of plants in that situation. Okay, so here's the stripto explanation right here. We have developed a, um, a stripto machine that, that's um, more uh, like basically no-till. We've taken a John Deere 2510H, it's a hydrous ammonia machine, so effectively a micro death machine, and we converted it into a strip until machine where it only slices the ground, right? We, we're, it has a 22 inch blade, slices the ground, drops the fertility at between one and five inches wherever we put it, and then the sealers in the bag zip it closed. You really can't tell that we pass through. Minimal damage is being done to the hyphae in the soil. So, in association with living plants, our mycorrhizal fungi aggregates particles, soil particles. Improves water infiltration and oxygen in the soil. Like you and I, we have to have oxygen to survive. Plants are no different; they need to be able to breathe. This enhances their biological, enhances other uh, beneficial microbes to grow humus, fix nitrogen, and improve soil structure. So, an example of that is here on our farm when we begun to do interseeding in our corn, finding cover crops between the between the corn rows while the corn grows. These two pictures I'm gonna show you are taken 10 feet apart. So this is a, a common no-till section um, with our sandy soils here. We have some plating, we have uh, collapsed structure, um, and it's just not uh, infiltrating water or very far from it. 10 feet away from that, where we have faulty rock in between, all of a sudden we have aggregation, we have pore space, we have separation, we have water infiltration capability. Our plants are gonna succeed much better for us in this situation, yield better. So these, Fungus and these living roots are able to produce this aggregation in order to uh, enhance our plants. Another picture when the plants are young, these plants are, are no more than B4 at this stage. The corn plants uh, planted into a tall rye cover crop. You can see the aggregation that has been uh, created and how quickly the roots are reaching down into the soil profile, uh, becoming more drought resistant as they go along. So this is a little study that we did on our farm that involves companion crops um, that's growing other plants alongside our cash crop. It is not necessarily a, a mycorrhizal fungi test, but we were we have used it in, in the trial. What I want to show from this here is the interplay between the two species, the multi-species. So mycorrhizal fungi enhance both organic and inorganic nitrogen by stimulating populations and activity of free living symbiotic nitrogen bacteria. So we have rhizobium, which we know grow on our legume roots, but we also have a free living symbiotic nitrogen, which is called, uh, one of the species is called azotobacter. We began to work with these plants. They do not have to have a root to associate. The AMF used with them is enhancing the plant uh, almost in a symbiotic way. The mycorrhizal fungi provide sufficient phosphorus to the plant, as well as meeting the energy requirements of the nitrogen fixing bacteria. So these guys are doing double duty. They're able to uh, share or connect between the two. So the mycorrhizal fungi not only enhances the main NPK take up, take up in a plant like phosphorus, but it can also pull in low concentration nutrient, immobile nutrients in the soil like cop uh, copper, iron, potash, calcium, magnesium, and zinc. So this quick picture here again, um, this is not necessarily a mycorrhizal fungi. It is a, uh, a most likely a saprophore sap fungi, but this is showing you the, the beneficial soil environment that we have and the connection between the plants. We have decomposing fungi, we have sharing fungi. This picture here shows you the multiple strands of fungus tied together. On the lower side of the picture, you can see where the fungus was actually uh, inserted into the root and connected to that plant. You can also see the, the, the soil clumping, uh, uh, raster roots around the roots of that plant, where this is, as far as I'm understanding, this is a proof and, and, and showing of a mycorrhizal fungi because we're zooming carvings and we're building that structure around there. And uh, that shows that our, our plants are truly making association. So this is where the rubber hits the road in regards to that study. The screenshot on the left shows you this is a nitrogen percentage in the plants, a leaf sample taken on the different trials. The first one shows the full nitrogen application, 50 gallons uh, between planting and side dress. That had a 2.94% nitrogen uh, in that plant. 
the center picture shows um, a companion crop plus the 20 gallons of nitrogen planting and then only 15 gallons of side grass, we had 3.08% in our nitrogen in our plants. In the third picture, we only have a, we have a companion and only 20 gallons of nitrogen applied at planting, but zero applied as a side grass. We have 3.24% nitrogen applied. As we reduce the available nitrogen, synthetic nitrogen in the soil, and we relied on the natural biological uh, exchange between the plants through the mycorrhizal fungi uh, association and connection, we raised our nitrogen availability. Now that's backwards to common thinking in, in our um, agricultural production today, because more is better, right? You'll notice at the bottom of that screen, it says that we had a 10 bushel advantage to that biological approach. And that is what is really excited us about the potential of working with symbiosis in our soil. Mycorrhizal fungi controls plant pathogens. They do this by using all the available root space. They take up the in, in, inception or interception points on the root so that a pathogen has no place to hook up. Right? Um, a pathogen finds a food source, and they'll hook up, they'll hook into it, but unfortunately they just take, right? They want to pull the plant down. Or a mycorrhizal fungi, that's a two-way street. They give and they take at the same time. So we want those, those mycorrhizal fungi to take up that root space. You can see the raster roots, the root roots that are being covered in the soil um, and it bonding to it very well due to that uh, glomerular on our um, carbon on it and sugar. So keeping the roots alive year round for us is one of our main goals here. We have a shorter growing season than some of the folks in the South. And so we have to come up with different ways. Interseeding so that we have corn, uh, living root and corn after it dies. We have we have plant our roots into our, our cover crops into our wheat as soon as we harvest that. And then we're also sp um, spreading or planting after soybean harvest. You can see by this picture, we have the aggregation going on here. We've got fungal growth, we've got uh, sugars bonding these, these uh, soils together to make a beautiful aggregated picture. So after soybean harvest, uh, a lot of folks, and then also our corn harvest, a lot of folks. Um, would say no it's not worth planting anything now these little guys here this is oats uh rye is first uh barley in the middle i believe and oats on the right these guys were planted and this is 11 days after planting and um, this is in october so we're somewhere around the end of october this is what these plants would look like you can see that we have roots that are that are completely clumped we have roots that are extensively grown and plants that are really taking off these great these grains really love growing in the cold weather but what we're doing here is we're able to uh, continue to foster our mycorrhizal fungi in the soil, along with our other microbes. We're keeping them alive. It's not going brown, we're keeping it green. So that in the spring, when we go to plant, this is what our soils, our sandy soils can look like. You've seen pictures before there, how it was plated, et cetera. Now we're getting into uh, more aggregation. We have way more water infiltration during the spring. We have uh, the soils will, our, can take our equipment passing over top of a couple crop roots can carry our weight but we're getting so much more oxygen available at the same time. Okay, that's what I have for you folks there. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer that. Okay, well, I'll, I'll start with a, a few questions here. Um, so do you have any, I guess, examples of crops that have um, kind of broken those AMF associations? And, and maybe you could just speak to that, like how you went about rebuilding that, that association. Yeah, for sure. Um, we have canola in our rotation, and that makes it very difficult because it does not make the association. Um, we can see the benefits of the plants that do have the association just by growing these different crops. We have um, uh, canola is just a, a nutrient monster. It wants to be fed constantly, whereas our corn, etc., is a much lower nutrient uptake. We can use reduced levels on it and still get the same results. Now, when it comes to plants that kind of break the mold, soybean is our largest concern. And I'm glad that the research is being done on these plants. We're having a difficult time um, having those plants make the association successfully, uh, but maintaining it because of the nutrient uptake that we're having to supply. We're getting into a nutrient deficiency and things of that nature. As we go biological, as we plant green, we're seeing less and less nutrient deficiency as we go along. So we believe we see that the mycorrhizal fungi and the other nutrients are coming back to life at, at that point. And maybe I missed it. What were you using for your the companion crop there with corn. No, I for, forgot to say that. I apologize, folks. Um, we have faba bean in there. That's a legume. We've got your uh, buckwheat, and we also have peas. Peas and, and faba beans are known to be mutualistic with corn, 
and they have a different root system, they have a different nutrient structure. They do not go after the same thing that the corn does, so they function well together. We're also using um, the buckwheat with soybeans as a uh, secondary or a companion crop. Uh, we're experimenting with um, uh, terminating that uh, buckwheat before it goes into seed uh, and having the nutrient or phosphorus, they're excellent at, at cycling phosphorus, having that phosphorus release, release two or so beans there. Okay, and um, just with the increase in fertilizer uh, prices, uh, I guess, how has your system helped you in comparison maybe to some of your neighbors? So that's a very good question. Um, we are, uh, our first main success in our opinion was to move towards strip till. That's given us a concentrated form under our plants. That was our, one of our biggest things. But when it comes to reduced fertility in our crops, we've done extensive testing in that regard. For, uh, like I said, corn, if we compare to our neighbors, we're using a third of the, of the fertility that some of the neighbors are. Nitrogen for us is uh, 0.7 pounds per bushel, where other folks are up over the one. Uh, we're lowering that number steadily as we determine uh, what our nitrogen releases from these cover crops and as we establish our uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria. Um, one example with our nitrogen fixing bacteria, how we've been able to really reduce our nitrogen is um, it's a bit of a story in that when we, because we make our own extracts from our own compost, so that's washing the bugs off of compost, we apply that in furrow with our crops to enhance the bio biology. At the same time you do that, you have to be very careful with the water that you use. Uh, town water, et cetera, is, uh, contains um, uh, your um, chlorine, which is nothing more than a bacterial killer, right? It's supposed to do that. I made a mistake one night around 10 o'clock, leaving to go plant a field. I loaded from the wrong tank and used a chlorine water in with this extract and this azotobacter nitrogen. When we did our nitrogen pours in, uh, in season, we had 12 pounds availability of nitrogen being produced or available to us in the row on those farms where there was uh, the azotobacter applied, but with the wrong water. The farms outside of that, that had the proper water applied, we had over 128 pounds of nitrogen available to us. So that is a huge nitrogen reduction in our use. We can't we can't duplicate that every year because of moisture conditions, et cetera, in the spring, but that shows you the, the, what the, those plants, an intentional, unintentional uh, uh, experiment, but it shows us the power that these little nitrogen fixtures have for us. Uh, just listening uh, to you through this, uh, Dustin, maybe you could just speak to what, what started your interest kind of down this, uh, down this path of, of, of fungi and, and, and cover cropping? For sure. Um, personally, for me, um, I, I'm, I'm a second generation farmer with my dad. Um, my dad's got it all figured out, right? He's been, he has a successful farm. He runs things very well. It was the agronomic side of things that were lacking on the farm. So we began to pay attention to that. But as I started to pay attention to it and I started to do reading um, and I started taking some classes and things of that nature, we began to realize that we are not, we're looking far much too much on the mechanical um, and the, the, the physical of the soil and not the biological. So once I started to put those pieces of the puzzle in it, uh, Innovative Farmers was a huge help with that, bringing in the speakers, et cetera, in 2010, and helped to explain to us how these microbes work in the soil, how they actually exist and how they can. So that's where my love started for it. Once I started to understand that those would enhance and move our soil forward, uh, especially with water infiltration issues, uh, we really springboarded off that. Okay, we have a question here from Andrew. Uh, how does the reduced fertility compared to neighbors translate to yield compared to neighbors? Well, that's a difficult one because you, how do you get a straight answer out of a neighbor? <laughs> um, for us here uh, with the folks that we have talked to, we can go both directions. We have had seasons when we have done above average yields and we've done very well. Moisture is our, is our largest limiting factor here. And I will admit, and I want everyone that's listening to this to understand that moisture controls everything. You know that as a farmer, but even microbial activity, if it gets dry in the spring and we're relying on nitrogen being fixated and things of that nature, we can't. We have to begin to plan for a synthetic application to take care of it. If we have apple moisture, they can do a lot of stuff for us. Uh, on uh, Overall, we've had a few years that uh, we've had a reduction in yield, but at the same time, reduction in cost, we've come out uh, equal or slightly above. But on the average, we're literally average yields with reduced costs. Um, that seems to be our, our number, uh, that seems to be where we're falling so far. 
Okay. Another question from David. Uh, since our industry has been selecting cash crop species for yield based on high inputs, are we not also selecting for poor AMF uh, symbiosis? Um, I'm not the perfect person to speak to that. I've been shown or taught that the newer GMO crops can have less association, yes. Um, they ch change the sugar output and things of that nature that are that are being um, used. Ourselves here on the farm, we've combated, we combat it two ways. We're all non-GMO crops on, on this farm, um, but we also, um, anywhere we can, we keep our own seed. And we, we grow our own plants. We are, then our plants, our seeds are already coated in the microbes. They've already been, uh, the genome is already associated with what's in our soils um, and we're able to make the best associations that we can. That's how we try to battle that. Great. Um, Rachel, maybe anything uh, in the literature on that particular question? Um, so yeah, like I feel like you're, you're definitely not selecting for AM fungal associations, um, but the fact that like they're so like ubiquitous in the soil anyway, like that's not as much of an issue. Like the bigger issue would be like the conditions within um, like agriculture that does like just reduces the whole community. Um, so like that would be like the tilling, the uh, fungicide, and like all that would be probably of greater concern, I think. Okay, um, great. Uh, Dustin, thank you uh, very much for joining us uh, this morning. And, uh, and, and certainly uh, we'll, uh, we'll continue to be in touch because, uh, you know, the, the, just to see like how uh, Rachel's project ends up going, um, yeah, it, uh, it'd be great to, to, to keep connected, to, to see how, uh, it impacts, uh, farmers like you who are, uh, have been doing this for a while. So, so thanks for joining us. Excellent. I do look forward to seeing the results. Thank you, Rachel, for, for bringing this forward. Okay. Uh, so Cameron, I think we're going to turn it back to you, uh, to give some instruction on the next steps here for the conference. Thanks everybody. Yeah, thank you to uh, Dustin and Rachel. And uh, yeah, the next steps are fairly simple. We're going to take a break now and we'll be back at 1 p.m. with another session. So uh, hope to see everyone then. Thanks.